Growing up, I went to church on the weekend and sang the Psalms, uh, sometimes uh, affectionately referred to as Dwight Armstrong's greatest hits because they were all settings of the Psalms and uh, a lot of them were kind of, uh, well, they weren't that great to be honest. Uh, but uh, Monday through Friday going to school in England, uh, you had to go to assembly. Every, every school day started with a worship service. So uh, in the morning you sang several hymns and then you uh, stood to, to attention while you heard the cricket scores, okay, or the soccer report or which house was playing which house in InterVarsity sports, things like that. And then there would be announcements, and now, boys, off to class. And then we were dismissed. So uh, the uh, traditional hymns that I, uh, I sang as a five, six, seven, eight, nine-year-old, uh, they still rattle around in my head, and that's one of them. Uh, perhaps you've heard the old joke as, uh, uh, as to the Christian uh, who found himself being held up at gunpoint, and uh, the bandit asked, well, do you believe, as a Christian, it's more blessed to give than to receive? And of course, the uh, poor victim of the holdup says, well, yeah, I suppose I do. Well, pilgrim, start giving. And this addresses a bit of a problem and a quandary living in this world. Today's assignment challenges us, as we read in Luke chapter 6, uh, a sermon, uh, or a segment of the sermon that's sometimes called the Sermon on the Mount, or a segment of sermon that's in Luke's version sort of on the plain because it very specifically says Jesus found a level place for everybody to stand. Could have been a level place, you know, on the side of the hillside that, we're, that, that he was on, but doesn't uh, matter that much. Uh, the point is many of the, uh, or all of the aphorisms that we find in this section of Scripture uh, are, constitute the, uh, the uh, ethics, uh, the foundational principles of the kingdom of God. And we will see as we read through this that it's challenging. In Luke chapter 6 and verse 27, we begin reading this assigned section. But I say to you who hear, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. To one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. From one who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who begs from you, and from one who takes away your goods, do not demand them back. And as you wish that others would do to you, do so to them. If you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount. But love your enemies and do good and lend expecting nothing in return and your reward will be great. And you will be sons of the Most High for He is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Be merciful, even as your Father is merciful. Judge not, and you will not be judged. Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over will be put into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Now, that's a big section of scripture, and uh, we're not going to be able to take every lesson and every point out of this section today. But I think it does strike you that we live in a mostly transactional world. In fact, you know, just almost totally transactional world. You scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. Uh, or as they say in the mafia, one hand washes the other. I'm sure all of you are familiar with that expression. Since I know most of you have a background, no, I'm just teasing, you don't have a background in mafia. But the competitiveness of this world, uh, which uh, promotes the idea, and if you've ever sat around and listened to business meetings, then you know what it means to hear the expression, uh, well, that, that doesn't work for me, and then the counter proposal, and the back and forth that goes on, uh, the zero-sum game that must play itself out in some way or another. Uh, I win you must lose. Now, there are those who will espouse uh, a much better ethic in, in business, the win-win, the solution. Uh, but uh, if you've ever listened to uh, any of the back and forth in a sort of a, 
a construction setting, which I have listened to from time to time, I can tell you that, uh, well, it's, it's, you know, it's, uh, uh, as my friend Ron told me many, many years ago when uh, our famous West Edmonton Mall was being built, uh, that you just get all the contractors and subcontractors together who have offered the lowest bid. And then you herd them into a room and explain that they're all going to have to cut another 10%. And that's just the way it is. And I've heard stories like that, and I remember Ron telling me that, you know, 25 years ago, 30 years ago. And uh, this uh, sort of uh, thing uh, happens all the time. Jesus covers the spectrum of human experience in this passage. And he offers a vision as to what we should be and why we should be. And that defines our life. Y yesterday I had a conversation with someone who's not listening on YouTube, by the way, not here. Okay, so I'm not speaking out of turn about anybody that you know personally. But he was asking me about the meaning of life. Uh, why am I? Why am I doing this? Why am I doing that? And themes such as coping with, in an unfair world, finding balance and purpose in life. He was talking a little bit about his wife, his children, his relationship with the working community, and so forth. And uh, after a little bit more time than I, I really wanted to be distracted. And you might say, I'm just sounding selfish when I say that, but I had given him the time, and so I closed out our therapy session and gave him a bill for $500. No, I didn't actually do that, but uh, if he'd have gone to somebody else, they might have charged him 500 bucks for life counseling of that particular nature. But a short time after, I got a phone call from a fellow I'd hired to do some painting uh, out in Vegreville, and he just said to me, well, uh, he said, would you be offended if I weren't to work tomorrow, meaning this morning? He's, he's painting this morning for me. And I said, well, why would I be offended? I'm just impressed that you want to go to work and uh, take care of the renter who wants certain things done. And he said, well, I have to take off as soon as possible to drive all the way to Vernon. And I have to see my brother because he's dying. And I want to go and see him one last time to reassure him that there has been a meaning and a purpose to his life and that where he is now going is going to be better life than the one he's enjoyed. And I know he doesn't quite feel that way, and he's in a quandary. And so I had this brief conversation, you know, hands-free in the truck, just on that. And then I was thinking of, because I wanted to engage another individual who's been up in Fort McMurray, and his name is Adam. You don't know him from Adam, okay? But I said, hey, Adam, are you going to show up and do this little thing for me? And... He said, well, he said, uh, you got to forgive me. He said, I got back late last night. I've, I've only been able to sleep two or three hours. And so I thought he was talking about uh, the, the nature of, you know, having to drive back from Fort McMurray and things like that. And he said, no, when I was up there, I heard uh, from my wife that she wants me to move out and she wants to work towards a divorce. And uh, he said, I just, you know, I couldn't work and I couldn't cope and now I come back and I can't sleep. And uh, he said, but I'm going to show up, you know, in a few hours after I do this and do that and do the other thing. I said, okay, all right. Well, I'm sorry that I sounded less than, uh, you know, I was kind of jovial, but also a little bit insistent. Are you going to show up? And he laid that on me. And, you know, within a space of like three hours, I have these conversations, and, and it just suggests to me the immortal words of uh, the poet Leonard, our poet Leonard Cohen, who, so, who put it so beautifully, he says, and, and so we struggle and we stagger down the snakes and up the ladders. And the, the nature of life, and here Jesus lays out this template that he wants us to follow in the midst of this confusing and stressful world. What do we say to that? What do we say? How do we... Uh, take his advice, which seems to be live generously, openly, in a giving way, and yet a world that wants to rob you, rob you of, uh, well, the intimacy and love that Adam thought he was going to enjoy, and uh, the, uh, the, the priorities that this individual wants to figure out, uh, or the just the loss of a family member that, uh, you know, the painter is, is, is facing. You know, and I just, those are three examples from yesterday. The struggle and the stagger, you know, down the snakes and up the ladder. And yet Jesus says openly, live generously. But I say to you who hear, love your enemies, 
Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. In a real world, Lord, that's going to work? Well, to a very great extent, uh, the conventional wisdom is simply this. Before you set out to achieve revenge, dig two graves. And this is the way the human heart is. Um, how often do you hear of broken relationships and people say, well, we had a friendly this or a friendly separation or we went our separate ways, but we remained friends. And it sounds kind of almost, yeah, because you know, oftentimes you hear, you know, of the bitterness of breakup, the bitterness and anger and the hatred and so forth that goes on, that, that haunts people for 10, 15, 20, 30 years after the fact. The ability to just say, okay, I've been hurt emotionally, physically, financially, uh, by reputation, but I must put this behind me. I must just simply stay calm and peaceful and move this. And, you know, when he says love your enemies, he doesn't say offer them the spare bedroom or pay their utility bill. But he says just don't give in to the desire for revenge. That was one of the themes that uh, I uh, explored with the fellow who was trying to figure out the meaning of life. Revenge. He said, how do, how do I cope with this? I've been hurt by this former employer. How do I cope with this by being hurt in this former relationship. I say, well, one thing that's not going to help is anger and bitterness. And I'd, I'd witnessed him, actually, uh, he has a pretty short fuse. And uh, one time his tools didn't work, so he just threw them down off the scaffold. He said, you know, and, uh, you know, as he stood there fuming and angry, I said, do you think that really helped do the job any better? You know, now you've broken the tool completely. You know, might have been helpful, more helpful if you took it and sort of put some oil on it or took it somewhere else to repair, or you wasted an hour, but you went and got a different one, but just throwing it down from the scaffold, do you think that's going to help? Conversations like that. You know, love your enemies. He's not talking about running up and saying, oh, you stabbed me last time I embraced you, so, you know, just, just let me give you another opportunity. But he's saying, you know, you might say to keep your own sanity, don't live with bitterness and anger towards the past. Don't get it. And of course, this is a very practical thing for people living under Roman occupation. Okay? Under Roman occupation. Now, I've known a few people, uh, especially one or two from uh, Holland, who uh, grew up, uh, or at least were children, under Nazi occupation. Uh, I can name three or four, actually, and uh, how they survived during that time. Uh, you know, tense circumstances. Uh, uh, I remember Otto von Lehn telling me that uh, there was a time when he stood between two German soldiers, you know, and they both had guns pointing at him. And he looked at both of them and said, hey, if you shoot at me now, you will kill each other. You know, you may kill me, but you're going to kill each other. And they stood there, oh, yeah. And, you know, he walked away from the situation. Uh, stories like that that I've heard both from men who are, you know, young men and young women during those circumstances. Uh, that getting along in a hostile world, how did Jesus advise to one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also? Okay, there were times when the Roman soldiers, you know, they could barge through a group of, and, 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 and maybe one of them just backhanded you. Get out of my way, slave. Get out of my way, Jew. And he said, don't immediately start thinking you're going to get anywhere by punching back at a Roman soldier. He said, you know, just, oh, okay, that hurt, but, you know, I'm not here to enter into some great hairy conflict with the oppressive Roman government. And from one who takes your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Oh, that's interesting. It was the Roman dictum that if... Uh, the mailman came along, and imagine you putting up with this today, uh, his mandate was to carry the mail. But he also had a mandate that said, hey, if I feel just a little tired, I can force you to go the 1,000 paces, the mile. And, uh, you know, uh, I can force you to do that. Or if someone came along and said, you know, I'm a Roman soldier, I'm feeling chilly, uh, okay, I need a cloak, you got one, you know, it was the scenario that we sometimes see in the movies, I'm commandeering this car, I'm in pursuit of a criminal. 
Well, in this particular case, I'm commandeering you carrying the mailbag for a mile. Go with him too. What? Uh, I'm uh, needing your cloak. Well, do you think you'd be warm enough? Do you want my T-shirt as well? And this is quite radical from Jesus. Uh, and he's saying avoid in this scenario the contentious confrontational spirit. Don't respond in kind. Don't escalate because you're never going to win in those circumstances. Uh, okay, he's punching down. Don't think you're going to get any further by punching up. You know, we've all had this uh, over the last few weeks, and we understand this quite, uh, quite well. Uh, we have the uh, big uh, con uh, uh, truckers' uh, convoys and protests and so forth. Now, uh, we became familiar with it driving to Red Deer. So they're, they're coming north, and we're going south. And we're seeing it, and of course, uh, there they go. Oh, hey, yeah. Uh, we're kind of frustrated with the uh, uh, mandates and with the, uh, what seem to be quite a few illogical things that are happening. So, you know, I'm driving, and so Shelley offers two thumbs up, one for both of us, you know. Uh, or uh, maybe it's three, okay? Uh, and, uh, you know, it's pretty hard to not feel uh, for uh, the, uh, the rights and privileges that they are uh, advocating for. And uh, unfortunately, you know, after a few weeks, it becomes a real inconvenience. Okay, as citizens, you're protesting. Then, unfortunately, your protests become inconvenient for other citizens. And so, you know, people say, you're, you're honking at midnight. So they sort of curse the truckers, which isn't, isn't the best way. And okay, you're blocking trade now, which is kind of really inconveniencing, you know, your fellow workers and so forth. So, you know, you're finding a balance there. And of course, now you get the what many would feel is an overreaction uh, to uh, the circumstances there. And uh, I hope nobody is hurt or, you know, somebody got their window smashed, which I kind of feel, you know, that's unfortunate. On the other hand, in a real world, I mean, yesterday I talked to an electrician who said he couldn't work because somebody had smashed the window in his car and tried to steal something out of the back. So. Yeah, everybody has something they're dealing with. And, uh, okay, one trucker got this smashed, and, you know, you wish those things didn't happen. But, unfortunately, there's no such thing as perfect protest. You know, when I was a kid growing up, uh, there was one famous journalist in England by the name of Malcolm Muggeridge. And uh, Muggeridge was, of course, an intellectual and a, uh, a public figure. And Muggeridge had uh, he'd gone to Moscow in the 30s as a journalist and he was enamored with communism and he got there and he lived under it for a little while and then he was dissing you know immediately said, oh this ain't working very well this isn't going too too well and so uh he uh in fact he was one of those in the mid 30s he was the only one he went he went to the ukraine and which uh, and witnessed the homodor and reported accurately on the fact that uh, Stalin was starving out the Ukraine in the uh, winter of 34 or 35, whichever it was. We're very familiar with that here uh, in Canada because we have a very large population, a Ukrainian population in and around Edmonton. Uh, I have a sister-in-law who grew up in Ukraine and she didn't even know about it. And so I had that conversation with her, but uh, Muggeridge actually reported it. They couldn't publish his name back in the uh, papers in the UK there were other journalists who reported it, uh, that it wasn't happening. In fact, there were journalists in North America who wrote that it was a, a hoax, it was fake news, and they got Pulitzer Prizes for it, interestingly yeah. enough. But Muggeridge, uh, when I was going to high school, uh, became well known uh, in literature class. We would talk about some of his writings and so forth. And in the late 60s, when I was first in college, uh, he came out as a full-blown Christian, which was shocking. Uh, because here he was an atheist, he was enamored as a young uh, intellectual at Cambridge University with communism, and he began to realize that ain't working. He began to realize many things, and in his writings, he then began to speak about the Christian experience. And it was Malcolm Muggeridge who introduced uh, uh, Mother Teresa, because he had served as a journalist in India as well, part, back when it was part of the, quote, empire, unquote. And uh, he witnessed the work of Mother Teresa in India over the years, and he brought her to England. And he brought her to England during a time of workers' protest. And the workers' protest, uh, they were uh, workers at the power stations, and they wanted higher wages. Yeah, yeah, probably de quite deserving. 
But in their protest, they shut down power for everybody. And a lot of people were cold, miserable, in the dark. And this is the nature of human protest. This is the nature of human, I want what I want, you know. Therefore, if I inconvenience you and I shut down trade or I shut down power and so forth. And during this time, Mother Teresa established her particular, you say, ministry, philosophy, working uh, body in England. And Malcolm Muggeridge, as a Christian now, uh, was present uh, for this particular inaugural service. And he, he wrote this. It's an interesting. He said, it was the most beautiful service I have ever attended. The electricity workers go slow was on. So we had only candlelight, which somehow added to the mystery and majesty of the proceedings. I thought of the vain battle of greed, which had plunged London in darkness that day, and of how such battles and such darkness are the stuff of history and the fruit of our unredeemed moral natures. Here in this front parlor of a small suburban house where an altar and a cross had been set up, a little clearing was made in the dark jungle of the human will. I was enchanted to be there. That's an interesting quote from Muggeridge in his book, Something Beautiful for God. As I said, he came in the height of his journalistic career into Christianity and uh, then through, uh, well, I often read his uh, stuff in the late 60s as a student and into the 70s uh, on the impact of the Christian faith, how it really changed him and how it had to change society. And Jesus is here in his, quote, Sermon on the Mount saying that the transformation of the individual is the beginning and the foundation of the kingdom of God. And I use the word foundation uh, loosely because, of course, it is Jesus who is the cornerstone. But you know what I'm saying here. It begins in the minds and hearts of individuals. Individuals who recognize there's nothing to be gained by rehashing the hurts and the damage of the past, the theft of the past. There's nothing to be gained by seeking revenge in the economy of God. There's nothing to be gained. In fact, living generously, give to everyone who begs from you. Now, that was a real circumstance in Jesus' life. It was very easy to walk past beggars because they were all over the place. Now, in the practical application in this day and age, I don't resent paying. Well, yeah, I do resent paying taxes, okay? Uh, yeah, okay, let's be honest. But I don't resent the fact that we have a system whereby individuals don't have to starve if they submit properly to a review of the circumstances. Um, you know, I, I deal with a number of people who have rented from me over the years and still do, some of them, who uh, frankly are uh, recipients of social assistance. And the complaints that go on, uh, just had an earful the other day from one lady who felt it was appropriate to just excoriate the social workers. And I know that you know, they've all got a thousand cases on their, uh, their table to cope with. But, uh, you know, lady, you might want to cooperate with these people because they're trying to give you some money to help. And that, you know, uh, I was in a conversation the other day where somebody was discussing, you know, what true conservatism was. And, I, and so I asked a simple question. I said, uh, who was the first individual to promote the idea in that? He said, but he doesn't. That's why I want to finish up today so that I can take off tomorrow. These are simple truths that come out of this and I share with you today. It is not easy to live as a Christian in a hostile world. It's not easy to find the balance <clears throat> or the wisdom. And until we understand that we're investing in the next life, in the next kingdom, until we understand that we represent <clears throat> a kingdom that has taken the minds and hearts of humanity called the body of Christ, we will not be, well, we, won't, we, we just don't, can't make sense of this world because it will not treat you fairly in the sense that you understand fairness. But there has to be a rejoicing in our Father in heaven 
who through Jesus Christ has treated us, not fairly, but without reservation, given us grace and mercy. And standing as children in his family, in his kingdom. As we consider those principles and you consider the stories that you will run across this week, as you consider the challenges you're going to face even this week, try to process that through and see Jesus Christ at work in you and through you. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, as we read these words and consider this the founding document of your kingdom, of this kingdom that you've invited us into and that we've responded to, uh, that we've entered into, uh, please strengthen us as we go through a world that is unfair and is hostile towards your high ideals as you've shown to us through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Give us the strength and the encouragement that we need to walk faithfully in this path this coming week. We thank you for your grace and mercy to each of us today in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.